All right, everyone. Good afternoon. Okay, I have a couple things at the top, and then we'll get to our guest. Uh, today, President Biden signed an executive order state st establishing the White House, bless you, establishing the White House Initiative on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity through Hispanic Serving Institution alongside nearly two dozen champions for these institutions in Latino communities. The president also announced that today we are investing nearly $19 million to build research infrastructure for five HSIs. We know that these institutions make an extraordinary contribution to our nation's higher education system and shape the future of the nation. And over half of all Hispanic and Latino students attend a Hispanic serving institution. Today's announcements are part of the historic actions this administration has taken to expand economic opportunity for Latino communities. Next, one year ago today, President Biden issued a landmark executive order to ensure that America leads the way in seizing the promise and managing the risks of AI. The executive order directed sweeping actions to manage security risk, protect Americans' privacy, advance civil rights, and stand up for consumers and workers, and promote innovation and competition. Today, President Biden announced that federal agencies have completed on schedule each action that the executive order tasked for this past year, more than 100 in all. As President Biden has said, AI is the most consequential technology of our time. The President and the Vice President will continue working to ensure that this technology is developed in a way that works for the American people. We have uh, Chair of the, of the Council of Economic Advisors, Jared Bernstein, with us today to talk about some recent economic news. The economy has grown 12.6% has grown under this administration, more than any presidential term in 25 years. We have gone from the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression to the strongest economy in the world. 16 million jobs created and the lowest unemployment of any administration in 50 years. And inflation has fallen to 2.4%, the same rate as right before the pandemic, with incomes up nearly $4,000. Still, we know that there is more work to do, and we'll keep fighting to lower costs and grow the middle class. With that, Jared, I know you have more to share about this. Uh, thank you, Corrine, uh, for inviting me back. And thanks to uh, my CEA team for helping prepare the information I'm about to share with you. Uh, this has been a busy and quite positive data week so far, and it's not over. We learned today that real GDP rose 2.8% last quarter, largely accounted for by strong consumer spending. The quarterly PCE price index, this is the inflation measure watched most closely by the Federal Reserve, grew at an annualized rate of 1.5% last quarter. Consumer spending continues to come in strong, backed by the tailwind of a persistently tight labor market and easing inflation. Real after-tax income was up a solid 1.6% in Q3. That's more buying power and more breathing room for American households. In other words, this is another in a series of GDP reports showing the US economy is growing above trend and, as the slide on my left, your left, my right, shows, uh, uh, is, is outpacing other advanced economies. This is the U.S. and you see, uh, well ahead of the pack. We also learned yesterday that consumer spending, I'm sorry, that consumer confidence, consumer confidence spiked in October, up about 10% for the month, its largest monthly jump in three and a half years. Relatedly, the gas price this morning was $3.14 per gallon and is below $3 per gallon in 20 states. These data are consistent with the most important dynamics of the macro economy during our administration, strong GDP growth, strong job growth, accompanied by falling inflation. 
In fact, as CEA has shown, real GDP is up uh, just, uh, just under 13%, as uh, Karine said, since the president took office. And there you see that in the last bar there. Uh, since the uh, president uh, took office and has consistently beat forecasters' expectation. Case in point, if we compare real GDP, where, where GD, the level of real GDP is today, with the Congressional, Budget's office, with the Congressional Budget Office's last pre-pandemic forecast, today's level is $9,800 higher per capita than it was expected to be. Real wages and incomes have also consistently been on the upswing with real incomes up almost $4,000 during this administration, boosting workers' buying power. Now on Friday, we'll get the October jobs report, which will reflect the labor market impact of several strikes, Hurricane Helene and possibly Hurricane Milton. The BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics strike tracker, estimates that there are three strikes that will be reflected in Friday's report, reducing national payroll employment by about 41,000 jobs, a number well above the usual monthly strike count. Uh, note that the East Coast port strike ended before it could have an impact or an effect on the October payrolls. Regarding the hurricanes, outside analysts estimate that the extreme weather could lower, could, lower payroll employment by as many as 60,000 jobs, though unlike the strike estimate, this estimate is subject to considerable uncertainty. In other words, outside estimates suggest that strikes and weather-related events could collectively lower October payrolls uh, by, uh, actually, could collectively lower the change in the October payroll uh, by as much as 100,000 jobs. Now, while we're doing all we can to help with these temporary disruptions, we remain confident in the underlying strength of the U.S. labor market. At the same time, it's important to keep in mind that these disruptions will make interpreting this month's jobs report harder than usual. Despite the recent positive data flow, let me be crystal clear that there are no victory laps here. We know that prices are still too high for families, making our cost-cutting agenda as urgent as ever, and we will continue to fight to lower costs in key areas, including health care, prescription drugs, child care, housing, and more. But what these data do show is a strong economic foundation that we must continue building upon. We must especially maintain this progress against efforts by congressional Republicans to drive inflation up with a large national sales tax in the form of tariffs, and we will fight their efforts to repeal uh, the very cost-cutting measures I just referenced. With that, I'll take your questions. Good on. Uh, thank you. Um, there are signs uh, that U.S. consumer durability is due to the spending by affluent households. I wonder if you just address how does this square with the administration's uh, bigger message about focusing on the middle class and the poor? Is this not just what we're seeing, wealth, the wealthy doing better and the middle class staying at the same or even doing worse? Well, first of all, one thing we know, we've documented this a great deal, but there have been some newspaper articles that also have this uh, in the past week, um, is that when labor markets are persistently tight, and as you heard Kareen say, the unemployment rate has uh, been at a 50-year low in terms of its average over our watch, that tends to disproportionately help the most vulnerable families. So one thing we can tell you with great certainty is that wages and incomes have grown most quickly for those in the bottom half of the, uh, of the income or wage scale. Um, now, you mentioned consumer balances. So one thing that uh, often gets looked at at this point in time is uh, these balances and their, and their trends without reference to income. You have to really look at uh, debt service obligations, how much people are, um, how, how, uh, what, what uh, is the burden on their income when they have to service their debt. So let me share a few numbers with you. Consumer debt service ratios, okay? So this is consumer debt, servicing your consumer debt as a share of your disposable income. This is a Federal Reserve number, and the most recent data is for uh, the second quarter of this year. In 24Q2, the consumer debt service ratio was 5.6%. 5.6% of disposable personal income for consumers to service their debt. 
in the quarter before the pandemic, it was 5.8%. So it's actually a tick down. The average over the full spate of the data is just under 6%. So again, that's a measure where we're doing pretty well relative to historical trends. I think the key here is that when thinking about debt, we have to think about debt service as a share of income. We have to look at the debt. It's something we track carefully. You're right to raise it. But we also have to look at the income trends, which have actually been particularly favorable for lower income families. Thank you so much. So you talked about the further need to continuing to lower prices for Americans. The vice president has talked a lot about going after corporate price gouging in groceries. So just how much is corporate price gouging to blame for inflation and the prices of groceries? And how effective would a federal ban on corporate price gouging be? Well, one thing that has really struck me and our team at CEA and NEC is the extent to which uh, profit margins remain elevated and um, labor share of income remains uh, somewhat lower. That is the share of national income, you know, going to workers typically in a, a strong economy. We like to see that tilting up and we have seen it trending up much in the spirit of the answer to the last question I just gave with the particular uh, benefits uh, going to lower income families. But profits are still quite elevated, uh, and we see that particularly in the grocery sector. So I do think there's a connection uh, between elevated uh, profits and some of the uh, price movements we've seen. In terms of the impact of, uh, of legislation, look, I think where uh, the uh, vice president is coming from there is that uh, uh, there are a, a bunch of states that already have uh, the authority to take action against price gouging, for example, in the in the case of an extreme weather event, and you know nobody should be ripping off consumers on a bottle of water when they're in the midst of a disaster. Having that legislation at the federal level, I think that makes a lot of sense. Good, Andrea. Uh, Jared, I want to ask you about. You know, we're in the well, less than a week to go before the election. I know you can't talk about the election, but. Can you say a few words about what you think the impact would be of the tariffs that um, former President Trump has, uh, you know, has proposed in terms of you know, the inflationary uh, impact? And what can you do now over the next three months if he were to win the election to secure the, the changes that have been made policy-wise that have you know, allowed the kind of positive trends that you've, uh, you've outlined here? Well, on the tariffs, uh, there have been numerous outside analysis of the impact of not just the tariffs, but an agenda that has sweeping tariffs, 60% on China, 10 or 20% on all imports coming in, uh, uh, deep, uh, deportations, and compromising the independence of the Federal Reserve. Uh, outside analysts have correctly labeled that as a pretty toxic inflationary brew, and I very much agree with that. Um, so uh, the first point is that um, I think it's. Uh, I think that the consensus among the um, at least economics community is that that is an agenda that pushes exactly the wrong way. Uh, if we're trying to help households deal with price pressures, with cost pressures, but then if you th if you then consider repealing the uh, uh, the IRA. Uh, now you're talking about taking a direct hit on measures that are actively in place, legislative measures that are at work in the economy, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, lowering the cost of health care coverage, lowering the cost of insulin. Those are, those are action items that are in the economy, helping families as we speak. To repeal those is to raise those prices. Um, in terms of uh, your second question was, oh, how, so look, I mean, I'm not going to get into kind of the politics of, uh, of what uh, one victory would be relative to the other. As you say, I can't uh, talk electoral politics. I do think it's important and interesting to note that the investments that this president and vice president have overseen have gone to all parts of the country and have disproportionately gone to places that have been historically left behind, places that have suffered from hollowing out by the loss of factories, by the loss of manufacturing jobs. And these places uh, are just as likely, in fact, I believe more likely to be red than blue. And there are many representatives I've seen with all different stripes who are pretty unhappy about the idea of repealing those measures because they see them actively at work building a factory in their district. So I think it would be uh, economic malpractice to reverse uh, such positive developments. And I think there are members on both sides of the aisle who would agree with that. Good. 
Would you would you stay on if uh, if Harris won and asked you to stay on? Yeah, I'm not going to speculate about that. <laughs> Good, Kayla. Thank you, Kareen. Um, Jared, I have two questions. If I may, the first is on the adoption process. Yeah. Um, you know, what is your thought process? Um, you know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? Um, you know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of adoption? You know, what are you looking for in terms of Said the economy is going in the wrong direction. Why do you think that continues to be the case? Well, I said in my comments, and I've said every time I've talked, either it's from here at the podium with Kareen or out there in front of the cameras, probably in interviews with you as well, Kayla, uh, that um, uh, that prices are are still too high for for too many people, for too many products. Too many households, and that's why our cost-cutting agenda is as urgent today as it was yesterday or before we got any of these reports. There is no economic report that is going to make any of us say, "Oh, well, we don't have to worry about that anymore in terms of cutting the cost of drugs or health care, or um, uh, uh, health coverage, or or housing or child care." I mean, those are serious structural issues where we have a, an affordability shortfall. In housing and childcare, and the president and vice president have robust plans to go after them. We need Congress to work with us on that. And uh, in my view, that that is nothing like a red or a blue issue. You cannot find a state in this country that doesn't need more affordable housing and more affordable childcare. And I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to find plans that are more robust than the ones we've articulated to add to the supply of affordable housing and add to the supply of affordable childcare. So we just need to roll up our sleeves and work together on those issues on behalf of the American people. At the same time. I did mention that consumer confidence spiked in October. I don't want to over torque on one month, uh, but uh, we do see an, a, a, an upward trend. And I think that that upward trend, while it's not where we want it to be, it's moving in the right direction. That's what I mean when I say building on the foundation we have. I think that upward trend in consumer confidence, in sentiment, while not where we want it to be, our work is not done, is telling us that easing inflation. Strong growth, a solid job market, and real wage and income gains are helping to reach uh, American households. But our work isn't done. You just mentioned the difference in the ideologies and the platforms of the two candidates for office through the perspective of outside analysts. And I know that you can't comment specifically on the election, but given that. GDP is backward-looking data that goes through just the end of September, and the fact that this election has been in a dead heat in recent weeks. I'm wondering, in some of the more real-time data that you look at, if you're seeing that election uncertainty play out in any consumer or business behavior. I think that um, well, here's a really arcane way of answering your question, and then I'll try to uh, speak English. Uh, but the arcane way is, um, and feel free to go ahead and test this. I believe that if you put Uh, the economic indicators that we've been generating in almost any election model, it would show the incumbent party winning. All right, uh, others have done that. You can look at those models. Um, so I, I think that that I, I, I don't necessarily buy the idea that these are necessarily backward-looking indicators. To be a little technical, if you look at uh, one of the line items in the GDP report today, private domestic. Um, Private domestic uh, spending, which is basically consumer spending plus business investment, consumer spending plus business. So take out net exports, take out inventories, take out government, take out a lot of the noisy stuff, and look at the core of the private economy. Uh, again, consumer spending and private investment. It was up 3.2 percent, higher than the GDP, which was up 2.8. The reason I reference that is that is the best predictor of where GDP is heading. PDFP is what we call it. We've written about it on our on our website today. Please read the CEA blog uh, and follow our tweets. Um, and 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 that is that's a forward-looking measure. So I feel pretty confident in those assertions. All right, Ed in the back. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. Um, and Kareem. So average hourly wages, um, Jared, are down 1.4 percent from the month President Biden and Vice President Harris got into office in December of 2021. Overall, prices are up 20 percent. In that same time, Americans have racked up a record amount of credit card debt, 1.14 trillion. So, why does this economic growth come with such hardship? So, we've had this conversation before, but let's have it again. Um, I think you make uh, an analytic mistake with respect uh, when uh, when you start measuring wage trends from 
Uh, what I guess it's January 21. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, January 2021. Yeah. January 2021. I don't have the graphic here, but we have it all over the place, and I'll make sure you and others get it. Wages were spiking in that month. Now, how the heck could wages be spiking? I mean, going way up. It looks like a mountain peak. How could wages be spiking in such a lousy economic month of January 21? The reason is that that is the heart of pandemic employment displacement. Who gets displaced? Low wage workers. So if you compare to that mountain peak, you're always going to get a decline. And so it's a distorted measure. What you want to do is compare to a period, say, before the pandemic to where we are now. And if you do that, you see uh, wages are up, you see incomes are up, just like I, I uh, stated in my, uh, in my comments today. And we have uh, many of these indicators that we're happy to share with you. Um, I think, again, on the, on the consumer credit point, it's important to look not just at consumer credit, but at debt service relative to income. We do see incomes, as I've mentioned, incomes have been rising, real incomes have been rising at a good clip, and therefore people have been able to service their debt uh, at levels that are historically pretty low. So look, it's something we have to watch. I do think one else thing that's happening, that, that this, may, this may resonate with you a bit more, because it's, uh, it's again, related to pandemic um, Pandem pandemic economics, which is its own weird beast. Um, uh, one of the things that we saw in the pandemic was that savings rates went also through the roof. People had what economists call excess savings, partly because they were spending less on services, right? They couldn't go out, and partly because of uh, fiscal support. Well, those excess savings led uh, to low-income people having more savings than they'd ever had before, their FICO, their credit rates, their credit scores were going up because their savings were so uniquely high. And so there's probably also a dynamic where people are needing to adapt to a world without those excess savings. And that, that also probably takes a little bit of time. But it seems you talk about the, the it's servicing credit debt. That's, that's almost treading water for a lot of families, just servicing and pushing that debt along. As long as your income is rising relative to your debt, uh, you can service that debt. And so that's why the numbers I cited. Uh, it's not getting ahead. Well, I think if you want to look at getting ahead, so there's 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 a couple of parts to this. You want to be able to. You're right. You want to be able to service your debt while you're getting ahead. So that's why when I cite the fact that wages are up for uh, workers, like over the past year, I think the increase. Well, we'll know we'll know more on Friday. But over the past year, real wages are up 1.5 percent for. Middle wage workers. If you look at low wage workers over the course of this recovery, this is an article from the media this week. We saw, I think, growth rates of you know seven percent over this over this recent period. So you can do two things. As long as you keep your debt service ratio in in in, in around historical levels, you can pay off your debt while your paycheck expands. And I think we've seen some of that. All right. Uh, thanks for doing this, Richard. Um, at the top of your remarks, you you mentioned um, you know the job numbers come out. Friday, um, you talked about you know some of the strikes, Boeing more specifically, they're still um, on strike. How concerned are you um, with what's going on with, with Boeing, and you know is there an urgent need from your perspective that workers need to get back and can you just elaborate a little bit more on maybe how some of the strike impact and even hurricanes could be reflected in the job numbers? Okay, well, starting from the last part of your question, um, uh, as I said, um, and as outside analysts have been writing this week, and you can find uh, various uh, articles to this effect, uh, the expectation is that the payrolls, the report in payrolls, and the key number there is how much payrolls went up in a given month in, in October, uh, we expect payrolls to be affected by the strikes. That's pretty much baked in. The Bureau of Labor Statistics has told us that there are 41,000 and change uh, workers who will not be counted on payrolls in October who were there in the previous month due to the strikes. So they can record that. The hurricane is much more uncertain. If you're someone who's not getting paid during what we call the reference week, which is when the survey was fielded, you're not going to be counted in the payroll survey. Now, I don't want to get into dizzying uh, weeds about this, uh, but the unemployment rate can be different. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're on strike or if you're still at work but you haven't been paid, but 
they call it, you're, you're, you're surveyed in the House, the unemployment survey, um, you, will, you will be recorded as, as, as still having a job. So the unemployment rate is expected to be less effective than the payroll number. But the payroll number is, uh, is, as, is, as, is as I mentioned, uh, expected to be affected by these distortions, though there is considerable uncertainty regarding that, particularly around the hurricanes. In terms of the Boeing strike, look, you know that our administration puts workers at the center of our economic agenda and um, uh, the president and the vice president have focused considerable energy on jobs, wages, and on worker bargaining power. So I've worked with Joe Biden for many decades, and that has always been at the core of his model. Workers need clout in order to get a fair share of the growth that they're helping to contribute to. In fact, my favorite definition of Bidenomics is that if you're helping to bake the pie, you ought to get a fair slice. And one of, way, one of the ways that happens is through bargaining clout, bargaining power, and that's why we've generally been uh, so supportive of unions. Any specifics about a particular strike, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to weigh in. Jared, you mentioned the recent wage growth, but as many Americans are going to be heading to the polls and voting based on what they've experienced and what they are feeling, when do you think people will feel wage growth and their wages starting to outpace inflation? Yeah, it's a really important question. It's not an easy one to answer. It has a lot to do with what C with we at CEA have made up something that uh, turns out to be a real thing. Uh, we call it your personal price vector. This is this idea that everybody walks around with a list of prices in their head. What's on that? What's on that list? Gasoline, groceries, sure. But if, like my wife, you're somebody who likes to garden, fertilizer is on that list, and you remember what things cost. You remember that you used to pay $3 for this and now you're paying $4 for this. Now one of the points that I'm making is that as your pay goes up, you know, that $4 becomes something you can afford again. So here's a calculation that we do that no normal person would do, <laughs> which is that it says if you look at how much work, how many hours of work does it take to buy a bag of groceries right now, it's about the same or even a little lower than it was before the pandemic, right? Because Yes, grocery prices have gone up, but especially recently, wages have gone up more <laughs> than, than, than grocery prices. So for, for, for whatever hours of work it took you to buy a bag of groceries before the pandemic, it's about the same, even a little less right now. So why don't people feel better? Because they still remember what things used to cost. They still have that, their, their, PPV, their, their PPVs, their personal price vectors, have yet to update completely. But they are in that process. And so one test of this theory is, okay, time has to pass. Inflation has to stay low so that prices don't get shocked again. You know, time passes, check, because that's like a physical reality. Um, inflation is, is low, 1.5% on a quarterly basis for the PCE last quarter. Real pay has to go up. And we have to do all we can to help on the cost-cutting agenda. Now, if all of that would help, in answer to your question, if all of that is truly helpful, we should see confidence and sentiment indices begin to tick up starting around now. And that's exactly what we've seen. We're not back to pre-pandemic levels. Our work isn't done. But the trend is our friend. We're moving in the right direction. And we have a strong foundation to build upon and a strong policy agenda with which to build upon that foundation. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Chair. Appreciate it, Jared. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you for coming. Okay. Let's see if I have anything else. Okay. Go ahead. Can you just address the president's comments yesterday, um, referring to uh, Trump's supporter as garbage? And I know he's tried to clarify that he was yeah. trying to talk about what the person said. Um, but one, I guess I'm, I want to know, does he think less of Americans who support Trump than he does of those who do not? Yeah. And two, why is he using that kind of rhetoric? How is that presidential? So, so a couple of things, a couple of things. So just to clarify, he was not calling Trump supporters garbage, which is why he put out, this is why he wanted to make sure that we put out uh, a statement that clarified what he meant and what he was trying to say. And so just want to make that very clear for folks who are watching. And, I'll, and I just want to uh, uh, read that out to folks. So he was regarding to the comedian, 
and I quote, I refer to the hateful rhetoric about Puerto Rico spewed by Trump's supporter at his Madison Square Garden rally as garbage, which is the only word I can think of to describe it. His demonization of Latinos is unconscionable. That's all I meant to say. The comments, the comments at the rally don't reflect who we are as a nation. And to your question, your other question that you asked, um, no, he does not view Trump supporters or anybody who, tr who supports Trump as garbage. That is not what he views. If the president has said this for more than three years now. He has said multiple times that he is a president for all. It doesn't matter if you live in a red state. It doesn't matter if you live in a blue state. He has said this himself. I have said it on his behalf. He believes that he's a, a president for all. And it doesn't matter who you voted for. It doesn't matter if you voted for him or not. He's a president for all. But hateful rhetoric, hateful rhetoric that he hears, and this is something that we've done many times from here. We will call that out. We will call that out. And that's what the president said. Is he, does he have any regret for not being more, his language was not specific. It came out, if you were listening to that video. I was in he, the room, Almer, I was in the room. I, I'm like, curious, but if you were I'm listening, just telling you that, that if I you was were in listen, the room. But if you were any sort of normal person listening to that video or looking at the clips online, you could come to the conclusion that he was calling, at minimum, this one man garbage, or not, if not all, Trump supporters garbage. Well, does he I, should okay. he be more? Does he regret not being more precise with this Wait. language? And does he does he also? I'm waiting uh, for the question to end. But well, I keep going. And I, the second, I apologize. Yeah, and no, the second no, part ahead. of that is, does does he have any regret for how this is shadowed uh, Vice President Harris's campaign? So a couple of things there because there's there's a lot that you laid out. Um, so uh, look, the president wanted to clarify because he understood that what he may have said was being he understood that what he was saying was to being taken out of context so he wanted to be very very clear about what he was trying to say um and i just read that out uh, once over you all have the um have the uh, have the the tweet or you know the statement that's on x if you want to read it right now feel free to do so and he was talking about hateful rhetoric and we've called out hateful rhetoric from here we have um Obviously, this hateful rhetoric, rhetoric was about a particular c community, uh, a community that uh, the, the Puerto Rican community, there are Americans, uh, they, this is somebody, this is a community that he respects, uh, and he wanted to make sure he called that out. And hateful rhetoric should be called out. It should be. Uh, and, but at the same time, the president is a president for all. He will continue to do so. He will continue to serve for everyone. I, I want to step back for a second because I think this is really important. Yesterday, we went to Baltimore, Maryland. He announced a $3 billion project in Baltimore. That $3 billion project is going to help 27 states. 11 of those states are, uh, are, have Republican governors. This is what this president cares about making sure that people who are in need get the need, get, get the assistance uh, that they need, right? We talked about, he talked about port, uh, port infrastructure, and we went to Baltimore. Obviously, we know what happened a couple of months ago with uh, one of the bridges there, $147 million for, uh, for Maryland in, in particular. But just think about it, 27 states, 11 states are Republican governors. And this is, we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which only Democrats voted for. Republicans didn't vote for that. Republicans tried to repeal that. Let's not forget what the speaker said yesterday about ACA, wanted to repeal ACA, wanted to repeal ACA, which would hurt millions of Americans. And so that's what the president wants to focus on, which is why he wanted to make sure he clarified what he said. But if there is hateful rhetoric that is being said about communities, Americans, communities across this country, He's going to speak out about it. It's not the first time that he's done so. Just briefly, uh, sure. separately, um, yeah. uh, is uh, Amos Hochstein and Bre Brett McGurk headed to back to the Middle East this week um, to try to revive ceasefire negotiations? 
And can you tell us anything about Bill Burns' travel as So well? a couple of things. Um, so following Israel's response uh, in a self-defense against Iran, senior U.S. officials are following up on a range of matters in the region and with Israeli counterparts. Uh, Bill Burns will be in Cairo on Thursday to engage with Egyptian counterparts on bilateral matters, as well as the process to secure the release of hostages. A CENTCOM commander, uh, General Eric Karila, is traveling to the region to discuss regional defense and will visit Israel to engage with counterparts and U.S. personnel. And then you asked me about uh, Bert, uh, excuse me, Brett uh, and Amos. So you have two White House officials. They're going to visit Israel on Thursday to engage on a range of issues, including Gaza, Lebanon, hostages, Iran, and border regional uh, matters as well. In all of these engagement, you will see uh, that the U.S. will reaffirm its ironclad commitment to Israel's security. It's warning against any further direct military attacks by Iran against Israel and its support for de-escalation backed by deterrence in the region uh, more broadly. And that's the engagement that you will see uh, from this administration over the next couple of days. Okay, Celine. Thanks, Green. So did President Biden make a mistake in his comments yesterday? He clarified what he said. It was very clear what he was trying to do. He was wanting to make sure that what he was, what, what he said was not taken out of context, and he clarified that. This isn't the first time the White House has had to defend or clarify the it's president's a, nobody, comments. Nobody's defending the president himself. This is the president himself wanted to clarify what he said. He wanted to make sure that it was not taken out of context. These are the president's words. Uh, nobody here is defending. We are laying out what the president said himself, and he wanted to clarify that. So those comments were made as the vice president was speaking about unity at the ellipse last night. Did the president speak to the vice president before or after that speech? Well, I, I think in, uh, in a gaggle that the vice president did not too long ago, she confirmed that she had a conversation uh, with, the, with the president. The president was uh, very proud of the vice president. She gave a historic a historic speech last night, and he certainly wanted to congratulate her. So that was after the speech. That was after and did the speech. president make any reference to these remarks or apologize to the vice what president? What I can say is I'm not going to get into private discussions here. That's not something that we do from, from the podium. I'm not going to do that. But the president and the vice president speak regularly. That is not uncommon. Uh, she is the vice president. He is the president. So obviously uh, they have uh, direct communications pretty, uh, pretty often. Uh, and he did have a conversation last night because he was proud of her, uh, her historic speech, and he wanted to congratulate her. And again, they speak regularly. And did you or anybody I'll speak to the president last night to seek clarification by what he meant once so, realizing he was being I taken was, and out again, of context. Again, I was in the room when he delivered his remarks uh, last night and uh, during the live stream. And what I can say is he himself wanted to make sure that there was clarity in what he was trying to say. Again, we are talking about hateful rhetoric, a hateful rhetoric that was being said. And the president wanted to be very clear. He feels, he also feels, and we've been doing this. This is nothing new here for the past more than three years. When hateful rhetoric is being said, the president believes it's important to speak to it and call that out. And that's what the president was referring to, a comedian, a particular comedian uh, from just Saturday night. Well, you all covered this at Madison Square Garden. Who was spewing hate? Who was spewing hate? against the Puerto Rican community, and the president felt that he needed to say something. At the same time, he wanted to make sure that his words were not taken out of context. And so he, he himself, uh, wanted to make sure that a statement was put out to clarify it. Okay. One more on this. Sure. Um, was the president reading from a script? It looked like he was reading from notes. Um, did he, did, so did, were those comments written out for him in what some I, form? Okay. No, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, it's okay. no, 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 for you to finish. I want you to finish your statement. I'm sorry. Um, I was just, I mean, you know, it would be useful to know whether there was, a, a, you know, a prepared remark that he was reading yeah. from, and if so, um, you know, whether that should have been changed or, or so, whether he was said. A, a couple of things. I, I, I'm not going to get into specific here. It's not unusual for a, a president or the vice president or any elected official to have notes in front of them when they're speaking uh, to a crowd or to a group of people. That is is not unusual. What I can say is the president wanted to make sure that his words were not being taken uh, out of context, and so he wanted to clarify, and that's what you heard from the president. He was very aware. And I would say I think it's really important that you have a president uh, that cares about clarifying what they said. 
Uh, and that's what you see from this president. He took it upon himself to clarify what he said. And I think that that says a lot about who Joe Biden is, that he wanted to make sure it was clear that he was talking about the comedian and their, the hateful rhetoric that was coming from this comedian uh, just a couple of days ago. There have been a lot of comparisons made to the Hillary Clinton remark, um, using the word deplorables. Um, has the president indicated to you any concern that this comment, this one comment that he has clarified now, could have similar reverberations to that previous comment. I mean, he was certainly active in politics then and was, you know, was, was aware of, yeah. of the impact that that had. I, I'm not going to go back and um, litigate uh, 2016. I'm just not going to do that from here. He was not speaking about Trump supporters. He was not, treat, uh, as a whole, he was not speaking about uh, people who support a different candidate. That is not what he was doing. Uh, and he clarified that in his statement last night. Uh, that was not his intent. Uh, he wanted to be very clear about that, hence, again, why he said he was speaking about uh, comments that were made uh, by the comedian. And let's not forget, we can't forget, uh, what we heard was the demonization of Latinos. That's what we heard of a community. By the way, you know, and I know you all know this, Puerto Ricans are Americans. Uh, and. Uh, he wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we speak out against hateful rhetoric. It's important to do that. Was he talking about uh, Trump supporters? Absolutely not. As a whole, absolutely not. Okay. Sure. sure. So the uh, president of, um, uh, who, was, who was just here visiting uh, President Biden said, uh, of Cyprus, said that he thought that there could be some movement on a Lebanon ceasefire within one to two weeks. He said that he had discussed this matter with with President Biden. I yeah. wonder if you can give us a, you know, a sort of an indication of whether you think that is also true, that there could be a ceasefire in Lebanon within one to two weeks. And if you could just comment on Israel's um, ban of UNRWA and whether you think that's helpful for the process. So look, uh, we're, obviously we're going to remain uh, uh, committed to reaching a diplomatic uh, resolution here to end the conflict along the blue line, uh, which will allow Israelis and also Lebanese civilians on both sides to, uh, to return to their homes. And this is something that we've been pretty consistent about, and we're going to continue to have uh, certainly uh, uh, that commitment to have a di di diplomatic um, uh, resolution uh, to end uh, to end what we're seeing along the blue line. Look, uh, you know, and we're also been very consistent as at to um, not having negotiating certainly in public. That is not something that we're going to do from here. Uh, we're going to uh, certainly uh, be optimistic, and we are committed to that. Uh, just not going to go into any. Um, any kind of where we are with those conversations, what's happening, uh, we're not going to certainly uh, negotiate out from here. Uh, as it relates to, um, I'm assuming you're 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 speaking about the Knesset vote on um, on UNRWA. So look, um, certainly we are deeply troubled by that, uh, by this legislation that could shut down UNRWA uh, operations in the West Bank, Gaza, and also uh, East Jerusalem. So we urge the government of Israel, we're having this conversation with the government of Israel to pause implement, implementing this legislation. We urge the government of Israel uh, certainly to ensure UNRWA can effectively carry out its mission and facilitate humanitarian assistance. Uh, but we also support steps to strengthen UNRWA as well, in part so that uh, UNRWA's impartially and neutrality, including to uh, respond to allegations, as you have all covered, uh, to ties to terrorism. Uh, but we are certainly deeply troubled by that, and we're continuing to have conversations with the Israeli government. Go ahead. Thank you, Karine. Um, first on the comments last night, was the president aware in the moment, as soon as he had made those comments, that they could potentially be misconstrued and be problematic, or was it only after conversations with aides? I, I'm, I'm not going to get into into a, pro a process. I think what's important is the president put out a statement uh, and wanted to make sure that we clear. He clarified himself, uh, uh, clarified what he meant here, and this is something that he wanted to do, uh, and that's what you saw from this president uh, last night. And I think that's important to note. I would also say, uh, and I said this already, and I'll say it again, from day one, this president has always said that he will be president for uh, for all Americans. It doesn't matter if you voted for him or not. And that continues to be the case. Uh, he was making a particular point, a specific point about a comedian and the hateful rhetoric that was heard. 
by all, by all of us uh, on Sunday, uh, but I'm not going to get into the back and forth. I think what's important to note is that the president himself wanted to clarify this. There have been a few times when the president has spoken off the cuff and uh, appeared to be off message or had comments that have needed to be um, walked back or cleaned up. And I'm wondering, going into this final very high stakes stretch of the election, if there's going to be any changes to preparation or format for any of the final events that he's going to be participating in. Well, the president looks forward uh, to being out there talking to the American people. You, you heard me talk about yesterday and how important that was, $3 billion in port infrastructure funding that's going to make a difference in 20, 27 states. 11 of them are red states. Uh, this is what the president cares about, to deliver for all Americans. Uh, and so that was uh, an event that, that was a great event. Uh, we talked about the $147 million that's going to, he talked about this, that's going to go to the port. Uh, and not just like dealing with infrastructure, but also creating good paying jobs, thousands of good paying jobs. And so the president's going to continue to do that. I don't have any changes to speak to from here. Uh, and, you know, you saw the president in Pittsburgh just this past weekend as well. Uh, and this is more of a campaign. That was a campaign stop, so I'm going to be really mindful. But he saw him talking to laborers uh, and union members. Uh, and they were thrilled to see him and very thankful for the work that he's done on behalf of union workers over the past uh, three plus years. And so that's what you're going to continue to see from the president. It doesn't matter if it's because of the election is a couple of days away. Uh, this is what he's going to go do on the next three months. And I think uh, the president enjoys being out there and that's not, nothing is going to stop him from doing that. On foreign policy, just finally, um, CNN is reporting, according to a high-ranking Iranian source, that Israel's recent attacks on Iran will be met with a definitive and painful response that will likely come before the election on Tuesday. What preparations does the U.S. have on our way? Here's what I'll states? say. Iran should not respond to Israel's retaliation. They should not. Uh, if uh, if it chooses to do so, if they do, we will support Israel in defending itself. But they should not. They should not respond to Israel's retaliation. Good, Karen. Thanks. Um, the White House had advised that the president will be heading to Pennsylvania twice at the end of this week, Philadelphia on Friday, Scranton on Saturday. Uh, obviously, very important battleground state. But first, can you talk about what he's going to be doing there uh, if both of those stops? And second, is there any thought to not having him out on the campaign trail in a battleground state, given the criticism he's facing for the comments from last night. So look, as you just stated, it's a campaign event. I'm not going to speak Saturday. to the, uh, on Saturday, yes. So I'm not going to speak to the details of, of the Scranton visit. Um, I don't have anything else to add beyond what we shared with all of you in the week ahead. I don't have any changes. I don't have anything uh, uh, more to, to advise from here. Uh, what I can say is what basically what I kind of said with, with Kayla in answering her question, which is the president certainly looks forward to being out there, uh, speaking directly to the American people, uh, talking about what we've been able to do uh, and deliver in the past uh, almost four years of this administration, and that's where that's what he enjoys, right? He enjoys having that that those direct con uh, contact, if you will, uh, with um, uh, with Americans. I don't have anything to share beyond what we already announced uh, to all of you and shared with all of you about what the next couple of days are going to look Give like. Give us a sense of why those two places. Did he want to go to those? I mean, they're pretty specific locations for him. That he has ties <laughs> look, to. I'm going to be super, super careful, super mindful from here. But as you know, the president is from Scranton. He loves Scranton. We've been there a couple of times. Uh, and I think he always looks forward to going back there. Uh, it is a place that he loves, a uh, place where he uh, spent a lot of time uh, in his uh, youth growing up uh, and still have close friends and family there. Uh, but also, uh, he also believes it's important to continue to be out there uh, to, to talk to folks directly about what we have done. I, I'm going to be super careful and not speak to uh, anything beyond that. Once we have more details and information, obviously, we'll share that with all of you. Good. Michael. Um, where will, excuse me, where will the president be on election night? Uh, so uh, we'll have more to share. Don't have anything for you at this time. We'll have more to share uh, when we get closer. Okay, and one more thing. Um, will he attend the inauguration in January regardless of who wins? I mean, this president believes in the peaceful transfer of power. And that's what you're going to see this president do, committed to the peaceful transfer of power. It's not about him. It's not about him. 
Yes, he will. It's not about him. It's about the American people. That's what the American people need to see. Regardless, regardless of who wins, the American, and he understands this, needs to see a peaceful transfer of power. And that's what you're going to see uh, from the president. And that's part of that, right? Attending the inauguration, uh, being there, being part of a, a, um, a, a what is regularly uh, done, a historic uh, kind of uh, process. He certainly is going to partake in that. Okay, Monica. Okay, just following up on two questions from my colleagues, for the sake of clarity, was the president reading Trump's prepared remarks last night? Look, the president had certainly, um, it's not unusual for, for a president, vice president, or any elected official to have notes uh, on what they are, what they want to say, prepared to say. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to get into specifics here. What is, I think what's important to note here is the president wanted to clarify what he said. That is what is important. And for a president to do that, I think is important. Uh, and I think that shows uh, the integrity of this president to want to make sure that, hey, I want to make really clear I was talking about the comedian and the hateful rhetoric that was coming uh, out of uh, his remarks on on Sunday, I'm not going to get into uh, I'm not going to get into specifics here uh, and and just leave it as that. I think what's important for the American people uh, to note is that the president wanted to make sure that he clarified his statement and is going to continue to be a president for all. It doesn't matter if you voted for him or not. And then just second, the vice president is facing questions about his yeah. comments today. So does the president regret at all the distraction this is causing from her campaign in these final days? Here's what I'll say. The, yes, the vice president spoke to this, and she said herself that the president clarified these statements. Uh, and uh, look, what... What I will say, and she also said, obviously, and you, you all saw this, that um, she uh, believes uh, that, you know, it doesn't matter who you vote for, right? She, people should have uh, their ability to, to make their decisions for themselves, which is something that this president also agrees on. Um, and I'm not going to, you all are covering this election. You all can speak to, uh, if this is a distraction or not, what I can speak to is the president wanted to make sure that he clarified these statements his statement, uh, and he did so. And the Vice President did say today she strongly disagrees with anybody who offers criticism of people based on who they vote for and why they vote for them. Mm -hmm. Does the President view that differently? Yes, he feels the same way. He feels the same way as what she stated. But that's something that the President has been saying for some time. He has. He has been saying that it doesn't matter if you voted for him or not, he's your President. Uh, he's a president for all Americans, whether you're in a red state or a blue state. This is something that the president certainly believes. And he has been saying himself. He has said this himself. Uh, and that's why he didn't want what he said to be taken out of context. That's why he wanted to make sure it was clarified, because that is indeed what he believes. So he agrees with the vice president. Ken Willing. You touched on this just a little bit uh, about the president agreeing with the vice president, but will the president be a little bit more careful in his upcoming events. I know you can't speak to the campaign events, but in his remarks, what is he going to do differently in terms of what he says to the American people for fear of isolating someone with his comments? Look, here's the thing. You have a president who wanted to make sure what he said was not taken out of context and took that extra step to clarify. I think that tells you where the president is. He took the extra step to clarify. and. You know, you don't see that from many elected officials. You certainly didn't see that from the former president. And this president wanted to make sure it was not taken out of context. And so he wanted to clarify. I think that tells you everything that you need to know. Just two yep. quick ones, if I, if I may, on North Carolina. I wanted to see if, if there's an update about yeah. resources uh, there, both candidates in North Carolina. I wanted to see what the hurricane response, mm -hmm. ongoing response is. And on the ballot boxes and the fire zone and the ballots and is the White House in contact with local communities about how they can keep their ballots safe or what's yeah. the White House doing there in response? So a couple of things there I do want to speak to uh, North Carolina and I think that's a thank you for that question because I think it's important for uh, folks to uh, uh, folks to have an update so as you know the Biden Harris administration when it came to um, dealing with uh, these two historic hurricanes Hurricane Helene and and obviously Hurricane Milton uh, we did an, a robust whole of government uh, response uh, provided that provided hundreds of millions of dollars 
providers and financial assistance to survivors uh, and to substantial debris removal and power restoration. And that is what you uh, saw from this administration as it relates to um, specifics there. This includes over $1.3 billion in assistance for individuals and families to help pay for housing, repairs, personal property, replacement, and other recovery efforts, and over $1.1 billion in uh, public assistance, including a support <coughs> local to support local and state governments as they recover and rebuild. And specifically, what, what we provided uh, to North Carolina, over $193 million in direct financial assistance. This is for survivors, obviously. And as the President and the Vice President uh, have said many times, their administration will be there for the people of, um, of North Carolina as they continue to rebuild. Uh, as they continue to deal with the loss uh, that they've had to uh, deal with uh, from both hurricanes, a historic hurricane, and as you know, both, uh, uh, both the President and the Vice President have been on the ground, uh, and FEMA continues to assist on the ground. As it relates to the, the, um, uh, the ballot uh, drop box fires, uh, first of all, we want to be very clear about this. It is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. Every eligible American has the right, has the right uh, to make their voices heard. And uh, so we are committed to uh, making sure that Americans' right to vote uh, uh, is, uh, and, and is, occurs, right? We are committed to that, and we want to make sure that is not undermined. Uh, and so we're working with state officials, uh, providing um, uh, replacement ballots uh, to those affected and are working to protect against future incidents. That's what state officials are doing. And FBI certainly is going to investigate uh, these incidents. So I would refer you to them specifically about the incidents, but we certainly uh, will call that out and it is unacceptable. Every eligible American has the right to exercise uh, their, certainly their right to vo vote and make sure that their voice is heard. Okay, go ahead, Gary. Thanks, Marie. A Supreme Court ruling allowed the state of Virginia to purge 1,600 uh, voters from the registration rolls uh, suspected of being non-citizens. Uh, critics argue that the ruling um, violates the National Voter Registration Act, which bars systematic changes to voting rolls 90 days before an election. Uh, what does the White House make of this ruling? So look, it's it's very similar to how I answered Willie's question, uh, but I'll start off with this saying um, it is already illegal. It is already legal for non-citizens to vote in federal elections, uh, and it is a federal crime that is punishable uh, by prison and fines. Uh, and again, as I stated to, to your colleague here, every single eligible American has the right uh, to make sure that their voices are heard if they choose so. Uh, and so that is something that we're going to continue to make sure that that happens. Uh, and I'll just leave it as there for now. The, topic, yeah. um, the mother of Shanquella Robinson, the 25-year-old uh, North Carolina woman killed in Cabo, Mexico um, in 2022 after a physical assault called on video mm -hmm. while vacationing with people she believed to be her friend. Uh, her mother filed a wrong, wrongful death lawsuit against those six individuals who, uh, and also names the State Department and FBI, accusing the agencies of negligence in their failure to extradite those involved and failure to properly investigate that case. Uh, given that her family did have a meeting here at the White House, I uh, wonder uh, what the White House has any reaction to that lawsuit? Yeah, I'm going to be mindful and careful here. It's a, it's an ongoing uh, case. There's a lawsuit obviously tied into this. Uh, so what I will do is refer you to uh, certainly the State Department uh, and uh, just not comment from here. Has the White House been in contact with the Robinson family outside of that one meeting last year? I, I, I would have to con connect with my colleagues here. I don't have anything to share beyond that one one time connection, but I would have to connect with the with the team here. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good one.